And now we have uh, another session uh, presented by Xian uh, Nafum, <laughs> he's an IT specialist. And uh, he's going to talk about social learning, which is uh, quite uh, new to me myself. So, uh, but I, he already uh, showed his presentation. It was uh, excellent. I hope you enjoyed it as well. So uh, he's going to talk about me uh, for half an hour. And we have a Q&A &A session for 15 minutes. OK, please. So thank you. Um, so it's interesting. I, I've enjoyed the last two days. It's always fascinating to go to an environment that's not your natural environment and listen to people talk about things. Fortunately, I have a research background, but we're talking 15 years ago, right? So that's when I was at university doing research. And um, I spent the last, or well, most of my career in IBM, which in many ways, the part of the company I spent in, you could say, a big part of it was research as well, right? So a lot of products being created, a lot of sciences. Some people don't know that, but IBM actually has the most mathematicians, right, in terms of researchers than any other sort of private company, right? So they have thousands of people doing research in things like maths. So it is a university. And um, I had another idea. So when I spoke to Fumi initially, right, we talked about some work I was doing on, on a platform called Cloud Clinic. But as I sat here last yesterday, I changed my mind. You know, some of the things I always do, sometimes I go and make presentations and I just talk. I don't have any slides. And I talk based on what I heard the day before. So I'm doing something similar, but I decided to put together some slides. And interestingly, these slides are from 2007. So back in 2007, I was the social business lead for IBM, and also I was working on workplace collaborative learning. And my job was to go and convince companies about how the world was changing and how they needed to um, share information and learn within organizations. So given that most of us here are researchers, and we're in the business of learning and sharing, I thought this was actually spot on, and I obviously updated it a little bit, right, with what's changed since then. So let's talk about, um, so it's social learning, and there are three things I'm going to talk about, right? I'm going to talk about what social learning is, um, the adoption process, and I'll end with um, some thoughts around how you get started. Now, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what social learning is? Well, let me even, I'll ask for two questions, maybe social learning and innovation. So can anyone define what they think innovation is first? Anybody? Any volunteer? Can anyone just, yeah, okay. Innovation has to do with creating new skills, 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 creating but, um, so if I asked you what social learning, what would you say? Guess. Okay. Guess to be socialized. Learn out of yourself. Learn beyond what you can create. Yeah, so you might... Trying to pick up from your environment. Exactly. So you might say learning from your social network, right? Mm -hmm. Your social environment. And, and you can do that in different places. It doesn't have to be within the context of a classroom or an institution. Okay, so, so that's great. So I want to start with this chart. And, and basically, this is a piece of research that was done a few years ago. And it talks about innovation, right? And the key point here, so if you look at this chart, most of us in the room are researchers. But the key point being made here is that real innovation comes from a collaborative process, right? And it's a collaboration between your partners, whoever they are, the, the stakeholders. So when you do your research, you're doing that because you want to influence government policy, right? So there is a stakeholder, somebody at the end of the day that needs to consume that research that you've done. And you probably have colleagues, so that, you know, there's employees, but you've got colleagues in this room, right? So it's a collaborative process. Research is not something you do in a silo by yourself. You know, you, for this to be effective, you need to do it collaboratively. And there are other forms. So this um, data actually breaks it down into, um, let's say, external and internal, right? So on the right, you've got internal um, you know, sources and external. But the key point is that it is collaborative. And if you're going to do any, so I listened over the last few day, um, days, and there was some really interesting work, like the case studies and everything were fascinating. But ultimately, what you're going to do with those, the outcome of the work you're doing, is break existing business processes, right? The existing ways in which governments you know, work and the way they actually govern, right? And, and a lot of your research is designed to get those stakeholders to rethink, right, their policies. You know, we talked about Rwanda, we talked about a number of different things. That's how I see this. 
So this requires um, an environment that's relatively flexible, right? Because if it's not flexible, it becomes very difficult to implement it. And I know we talked about governments and some governments being less flexible than others, right? So the question is, how do you use your work to influence that? Now, um, again, you know, as I went out back, back in those days and tried to get organizations to think about the benefit of things like this, I always used to tell them about how the environment is changing, and many of them might not realize it. And most organizations are very structured, very hierarchical. So you've got a CEO, you have you know, the reports, and you've got people that are reporting to them. That's how it works. But with internet, with technology, you know, uh, becoming more readily available, right? And with you having the phone number, technically speaking, of your CEO, and you having his email address, and you having the email address of your partners, the world has changed significantly. So even though you've got these former hierarchies, right, and there might be projects based around teams and tasks and job descriptions and things, a lot of work gets done in informal networks, right? So part of my, you know, part of the reason why I'm here is to get you to think about this and to say as you do your research and you've got these formal structures, right, be it based around partners that you're working with and stakeholders that are known to you, there is another world which is you know, slightly informal. And so you might kind of, you know, what defines some of the people you might be in interacting with in this informal world is based on common interest, right? So they have an interest in your research. So as you're doing your research, they could provide valuable input, right, into that research, okay? And you could tap into external knowledge, knowledge communities. And many of these knowledge communities or whatever are online, they're on the web, right? So you can get access to that there. So this chart is just, again, a, an encapsulation of what I just said, right? So you've got a formal structure here. You might have someone called Cole, who might be further down the organization, but he might belong in a network, in, a, you know, in an informal social network, where he's got a direct link to the, you know, the, the senior, what do you call it, the leader of the organization. So the challenge here, or the, the, the theme of this presentation is around, but how can we use you know, capabilities, be it technology or otherwise, to facilitate this type of collaboration. So we, we call now having access to, sorry, we call now having access to Jones, how can we make sure that he can benefit from his knowledge, right? And that's what it's about. You know, you're doing research, you've got informal networks that you can tap into. How can you make sure your work or your research benefits from that, okay? So there are three things, you know, that I believe are needed for that, right? And, and it, you know, this is obviously keeping it quite simple. But the first is around your personal productivity, right? So what can we do? What are the capabilities that you can start thinking about to help you personally? And that might be around, how can I find experts? And what, what places are available, right, around in the web or wherever it might be where these experts are? And how do you locate them? So you locate them based on the knowledge that they share, right? You don't locate them because someone said they're an expert. That's ev it's evidence-based. And that evidence pulls you to them, okay? Then you've got the whole idea around team collaboration. You know, we are in this room, right? We all reside in different countries, right? We all are maybe doing different types of research. It might be slightly related. So how do we collaborate when we're no longer physically present in the same space? Okay, so that aspect of team collaboration, generating ideas, brainstorming, and what capabilities you can leverage to facilitate that is quite important. And community building, right? So how do you build communities based on mutual interest? So I might not be a project man a member of your research, but I might have an interest in it, right? And as a result, if I know what you're doing, I might be able to help you. Or your research might be based in a country where I previously visited, right? So in that case, if I'm aware of that, I could also help you and benefit more from that. So, so from, as a technical guy, when I think of the whole space around research and collaboration, and uh, these are the three areas that I tend to focus on. Um, this is, I think, a very interesting chart. I'm not going to go through this, you know, line by line, but what I try to do here is to say, if you think about the old world, and the old, many of us in this room might still be in the old world, right, in terms of how we think and how we do our research, and then you've got the new world, which is the new way of collaborating. So I'm just going to pick a few, right? So some people in this room, like, in fact, we had a conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick someone. <laughs> so we had a conversation earlier where she, she just brought up a comment about social network. You remember? And what did you say? You said, you know what, I've been thinking about leveraging it, but it just feels like a lot of work. Yeah, so that was the statement that she made. And I think it actually speaks to that first point. 
right? That a lot of us think, it's, and it is indeed some, a great deal of effort, right? It's not as though it isn't. But the, um, the only, I guess the, the, the way you can maybe rethink that approach is to say that collaborative work is actually what works, right? Unless you collaborate, um, you're not going to be as effective, right? You might get a great piece of work done, but then the question is what influence does that have now on, in terms of implementation? So that's one. Um, collaboration is a set of tools. It's not, right? Um, it's actually about you know, working together on a research project in order to have a common, you know, an outcome that you collectively see, right? It's about doing work by myself. No, it's not, right? It's about being immersed in a conversation with others, right? And as a result, um, having that common interest. Okay, and um, content is protected. Again, this might be relevant in a research environment, right? So how do you protect your research, your intellectual property, before it gets published, right? Especially if it's being funded by a particular organization, while at the same time making sure that um, it's developed in a participatory type of way. So there's a trade-off, there's a balance that needs to be done there, okay? Et cetera. And the other thing that I'll point out before I move on is the fact that you need to always think about the end user. So what's the ultimate outcome of this research gonna be? Is it just an interesting or exciting academic paper? Or do you really want this to effect change, right? And if you really want to, it to effect change as you complete your research, you get towards the end, you need to make sure you have a way of having a conversation with the stakeholders, right? And, and if they're somehow involved in the research process before it becomes a lot easier, right? So you're not seen as dictating something new that they need to now embrace and, and, and adapt to. Okay? So, so a, a few other points which I'm not gonna go through, but the key message here is that it requires a new way of thinking. Right, if you're going to embrace some of these slightly more disruptive ways of working and, and collaborating with others. So, so the core principles around um, you know, this idea of social learning is first of all group interaction. Right? So there's this notion that whatever we do, we have a group and that group shares a common interest and a common goal. Right? That's the first. Then content is created by this community. Right? So you might be leading a piece of research, but you need to always feel, you know, there are other stakeholders who are part of your research team, be it formal or informal, right? And, and a lot of the times it's voluntary, right? It's fluid. The people who are in the formal structure are not necessarily the ones who maybe might help you. If you can find someone who has a, a very strong interest in the country because they are from Rwanda and you're doing a piece of research in Rwanda, and maybe you found a paper that they wrote, and that paper is part of your reference, and you pick up the phone and you call them, or you get on LinkedIn and you connect with them, they might actually help you a lot more than, you know, and that's the way, that's how I work, right? That, that's my approach. So that's um, what you call the whole, I'm gonna just carry on and you can ask questions at the end. So that's social learning. Now the, the next thing I wanna talk about is the adoption process, because that's always the, prop, the challenge, right? Not problem, but the challenge. You hear all these things and it sounds good, but the challenge is how do you actually make use of it? It's not so easy because it requires a great deal of effort, right? And we're used to working in a particular way, and not everyone's gonna change. That's the important point. But the key um, approach that I, I tend to take is, you know, when I think of technology, I don't think of it as tools. I, I think of it as um, something that helps you overcome um, barriers, right? Accelerate innovation. And like I said, innovation is a process. I, I call it a social process, right? That results in an outcome. So, so what we do here is look at ways in which we can eliminate the roadblocks, right? What are the things that prevent us from working in that collaborative way, right? And we do that by looking at ways in which we can connect people. And, and I think it's very pertinent in this environment because most of us are not physically in the same country, right? A lot of us are in different countries and, and working on different projects. And it's about getting all of us to be comfortable with that approach, right? So you flew all the way from Japan, you're the only one from Japan here, right? So how do you stay connected with this group once, you, once you've gone back? So you need to feel very comfortable about working in this, this remote way. Now, this is, this is interesting because what this says as well is that there are multiple dimensions to this, right? You need to look at the social dimension in terms of networking within a social environment. You need to look at the culture, right? And, you know, the, obviously the tools as well, right? But, you know, the social dimension is very, very important. We as individuals have our own motivation. There, there are factors that motivate us. Some of us have uh, information, we share information naturally. And I'm one of those, right? So my personal, my personality is to share, 
right? So if you come to me and you say, I need help doing this, or you don't even need to tell me that I need help. The way my mind thinks is to think about who I can connect you to, just naturally, yeah? Some people are not like that, right? Some people are actually, you know, they receive a lot of information, and their mind doesn't work like that. But you see, my mind works like that probably because of the environment in which I worked in for many, many years, right? So I worked as a consultant, and as a consultant, your job is to go and listen to customers and provide you know, advice, ideas, right? So that, that, that's my, 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 you know, my upbringing or whatever. But then you've got that. So you need to understand everybody within this network will have different motivations, right? And um, you know, again, you need to make sure you have the right, the right tools. Now, when you talk about tools as well, you need to be very careful, right? Some people are very, you know, very visual, right? So they need to see you to do business with you, right? So when you think about, again, your research that you're doing, some individuals, you might need to make appointments and go see them. Some, you know, make, having a call, having a Skype call with them is sufficient. But then when you're having a Skype call with some, you might need to switch on your video camera, right? Because just seeing you, sometimes you don't think about it. I know in this environment, because of broadband, it's a bit of an issue, right? But just switching on your camera can make a profound difference for someone you haven't met before because they feel a lot more connected to you, right? Others, uh, you know, others prefer to, like I said, use email, right? You know, the youth, the younger generation might prefer to use, you know, text messaging. A lot of us who are slightly older, that's not a natural way of communicating. So again, the general idea here is that as you start thinking about working within an informal network, as you're doing your research, there's no such thing as this is the tool that I use, right? Which makes it even more complicated, right? You know, there's no such thing. You need to think about the person. You need to think about the type of individual that they are. And you need to be slightly adaptable, right? One of the things, I think I'll have time. So one of the things I did was I set up, I, I didn't have internet, but I have some pages. And I'll show you how I work now that I left IBM. So I used to be in a company that had 400,000 people, right? So that's the size of IBM as a company worldwide, 400,000. And when you leave and you're working with two or three other people, it's a small world, right? So you're used to working in this large environment where you had a lot of support. So how do you make sure you keep that support? So even before I moved out, I made sure that I had an external network uh, that I could rely on. So I'll talk a bit about or show you how I, how I kind of do that. Now these are just, um, you can look at this later, but these are just some ideas, right, around the fact that when you think about your research, right, and how you make your research um, adopted and how you get known. One of the things I did, by the way, for me, I, I went on the web and I searched to try and see how much I could find on, on work that you guys did, just like on popular places that I would normally go to, and I didn't see a lot. Now, I might have just gone to the wrong places, right? Or it might mean that we're not very social in terms of we do a lot of research, but we don't actively promote our research, the work that we do. Right? So as researchers, I think you do. So because that has an impact on the organization itself, right? So the African Leadership Center, you know, you enhance the brand. The brand is not based on what the center does. It's based on the ambassadors. And those are the alumni, the people, all of us in this room. So you can imagine if all of us were active in promoting the research that we do. It's a lot better than a newsletter that the center creates and sends out. So, so, so that, that's, um, you know, that, that is quite important. But these are some of the tools that people use to amplify that message. Um, some people might have blogs, so the, in the center might have an external blog where you have different researchers just, you know, blogging about things. Um, a podcast, you might record things and share. It doesn't have to be live, because the challenge with a lot of us being based in different African countries is that bandwidth or, or just that travel, traffic and all these things might not allow us to be physically present in a live broadcast. But you could record it and share it. Newsletters, right? Um, Wiki, so again, if you're doing... Know, collaborate with. And by the way, do most of you understand these terms? I guess people, right? Okay. And then print media, that, that's normal, like brochures, etc. Now, these are some of the, um, the tools that, so I, I came up with this list just to give you an idea of the types of tools that people use to uh, communicate. So a lot of us use email, right? So that's the, one of the most common ones. But you have messaging. So these are things like WhatsApp. And, and I'm sure many of us in this room maybe use WhatsApp too. And to communicate. Um, there are tools online which you could use for tracking activities. If you're working in a team, you just define the tasks and you assign those tasks to people. Very simple, very effective. I like those a lot. Document sharing, you have 
things like Dropbox, Box. You know, you, you upload a document, you share it with people, they get sent a link, they can download it. It works very well. You could create communities. So within, I use LinkedIn a lot, and I'm going to show you LinkedIn. How many people are on LinkedIn here, by the way? Okay, so about, you know, maybe half, yes, about half. So LinkedIn has communities, and I'm members of quite a few communities, right? Online meetings, right? Um, you could have those as well. Bookmarks, so on LinkedIn, you know, people share posts and things. You, could, might, you might say those are bookmarks to some degree. Profiles. So I use, again, LinkedIn, I use that a lot. So I came, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do in Kenya, just to give you an idea of how I use LinkedIn and all these things, is to run programs, technology programs. And I want to do that in partnership with universities. So I had, I've had been having meetings with places like Strathmore and, and USIU or whatever they're called. And the way I connect is through my formal network, right, which is kind of interesting. Right? So profile is quite important. I was thinking about doing the same thing in Dubai, right? And there's a lady that I met informally, right, by chance, actually. I went to an event and she was there. But she ran executive programs uh, for women in Dubai. And um, when I got talking to her, I felt she probably was connected to a very influential network. So I shared with her what I was trying to do in Nairobi until I was coming to Nairobi. And she then connected me with a guy who runs the, one of the innovation centers working with the government in Dubai, right? So, so these capabilities are quite important. If you work hard at it, that's the thing. You need to kind of maintain your relationships and, and stay in contact with people. So it's not, it just doesn't happen, doesn't happen, but that's why I put in the effort, right? So you're asking the question, it's a lot of work, but you need to believe that it can help you to make the time for it, right? And, I, and it is indeed helping me. So before I show you um, a few slides, what I'm gonna do is just talk about you know, how we did this um, in, I, in IBM when I was working in IBM. So let me go back to the history of these slides. So I was about seven years ago, is it seven, in 2007, I became very interested in moving back to Africa, right? And I use that word generally. I, wasn't, I didn't care about where specifically. I just wanted to move back because I had been in the UK for so long, okay? And I'm originally from Cameroon, for those of us who do not know. So I went to Cameroon for university, and then after university, I worked there for, for a few years. So I wanted to come back. Now, the question was, how do you come back physically, right? It's, it's not easy because you've got commitments, you've got a home, you've got a mortgage to pay, you've got all those things. You're not just going to you know, leave. And, 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 and then there's also the issue of, is it going to work out? And what if it doesn't work out? So there are a lot of challenges with making that, that sort of decision. So by chance, I wasn't alone, right? There were a few others in the company that were also going through that process. So we somehow, I don't know how, well actually it wasn't us that created it. There was another IBM exec that came up with this idea called the World Development <coughs> Initiative. And the idea was that as a company, you have a lot of people who are interested in other markets, right? And so if you can pull these guys together and just get them to start thinking about some of the problems there, and in their spare time, coming up with ideas, you might come up with some pretty innovative stuff. Right? Because again, it's an informal network. And so those of us who are interested in Africa lashed onto that. And so we created this network within this entity. And that became very successful in terms of we brought us together. And to tell you how successful that was, when I finally moved, so I moved to Johannesburg, and I had the responsibility for expanding IBM's offices right, across the continent. The guys who were the general managers of most of the countries that IBM set up were all members, right? Because, again, there was no form of, there was no place that those who were hiring out here, who maybe were looking for people, could go to, right? I mean, HR will not help you, right? That's one of the things you, you know, a lot of these, you know, very rigid structures, if you go to HR and they say, even in IBM, say, I want to hire somebody to go do this in this country, from this country, they're going to find it very difficult. They might not even have that data, right? Or even if they do, they don't know what, you know. So informal networks are a lot more powerful. That's my own personal experience, right? So, but the key point about these networks is that they don't just work. So if we spend time and we introduce a lot of these tools within the Africa Leadership Center tomorrow, so let's say we had wikis, we had blogs, there are all these things that I've shown you here, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be successful, right? For it to be successful, you need a program, right? So fine, there's an element of you need, you need some sort of infrastructure, and then you need people to understand how to use that infrastructure. But more importantly, you need a program, right? So you need a deliberate, you need, there needs to be a deliberate effort to say, 
we're going to use this stuff because you know what? This is what's going to enable us to elevate our brand as an institution. And to elevate our brand, our alumni are very important. And one of the, I don't know if it works very well in, in, in Kenya. I think it does because I've heard a lot of people talk about alumni. But I went to a school in Cameroon that I think has an amazing alumni, right? But the way we don't leverage that at all, right? We don't even have a strong, well, we, we do have a community, but it's not as strong as it should be, right? But when you look at the individuals, right, that went to the school and what they're doing around the world, it's remarkable. In fact, the guy who was the captain when I was in the second year, he's probably three levels down from the CEO in IBM. So he's the auditor general. So in terms of auditing across the whole IBM company, he, does, he has responsibility for that, right? But we don't, and there are many of them, like many people who have been very successful, but that's not there. So you need um, a program, a process that says our alumni are important and we're gonna nurture that community, right? We're gonna leverage it. And so by doing that, you make sure that as the alumni leave the institution, they become your ambassadors. So uh, further grants that you get, right? Research funding and things like that, they are influential. They're influencing, right, and, and helping you get more. So that, that's the whole process, of the whole um, idea of putting together a program around this is quite important. Then the next piece is enablement, right? How do you actually get this to work? Fine, there might be an element of need to get people to understand how to use the tool. That's okay, that's given, right? But the more important thing is to think about the cultural issues, right? Like I said, people have different personalities. You know, some are givers, some are takers, some like to talk, some like to, you know, whatever. We all do things differently. So how do you, you know, what do you call accommodate all of those different styles? But most importantly, this is about capturing the asset that is most valuable in any organization. So it's not about what you own, it's about what you know, and it's about the intellectual asset that you have. So all of this research that's being done, if you harness capture this asset and you make it easily available, right, and you tie that in to the people that worked on those, irrespective of where they are, right, they might have left, it becomes very helpful for the new students that are coming in, right, like I said, as you're doing your research and citations, you're citing other people's work, you can also use these capabilities to have a personal relationship with them. So let me quickly show you, before we go to questions, I just want to show you this, and this is not connected, but I'll just show you quickly. My LinkedIn, I know most of you have used LinkedIn. Right? So I just want to show you a few things. So I, um, I take LinkedIn very seriously. And um, in my network, I don't know if you say, but I think I have about 1,800 people, right? Now, not all of them are important, but <laughs> <laughs> not all of them are important. But what I try to do is when I meet someone, I don't like keeping business cards, right? So if they're on LinkedIn, I then connect with them on LinkedIn. Some don't accept, some do, right? But I try to do that. And if they're active, then I get, you know, I get to see what, what they're talking about and what they're doing, right? So all these are just posts from my network, okay? Now, we had this type of thing within IBM, so that's why I was kind of comfortable using it when I left. But if you look at the right, you also see things like, is that, oh, okay, because I'm not online. Okay, so on the right, you start seeing things like, start recommending people that you might know. So the way I've, connect, I've configured it is connected to my email, right? So every time I meet, I add a new contact in my phone, and that person is on LinkedIn, it tells me, so I can connect to them. So it makes it easy for me to stay connected to people, right, and what they do, right? So that's, that's that one. Um, now the other thing it does is that, this is very interesting, that it tells me who has been looking at my profile. And it's interesting for me because I've left the company now, I've left IBM, right? So I'm doing my own thing, trying to do my own business or whatever. So the likelihood is that these people, so like him, I met him at um, a few, like last week, right? So clearly, he maybe thought I said something that was interesting. 
So you, you know, you might, I don't know why you went there, but clearly you did, right? So I find this quite interesting as well, just to see how you know people are checking you out. Right? That, that's essentially what they're doing. Um, and then these are the connections that I have. Right? You can see that it's very varied. You know, from you know people who don't have jobs. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, just very right? a lot of different people. And then groups. This is quite interesting. So, and if you look at this, you can tell what I'm interested in without a doubt. Just look at this and you know me, right? So that's the thing about these tools as well. So you can tell that I'm, okay, that's the network that I, the school I went to. You can tell that I'm very interested in Africa, right? That's the first point. And I'm a technical guy. So that, that's one of the two things that come up. And my area of specialty is cloud computing. You know, so it's, it's very simple, right? I used to work there again. Okay. So that's one. And then this one called Box. Very interesting. Like I said, I can't show you much because I'm not connected. But this is what allows you, as you're working on documents and you want to share it with your colleagues, you can post it here and it's private, right? So it's restricted. And actually, the, the center can actually have an enterprise account if they wanted to. So companies have their own accounts. But the idea here is that you create a document, you share it with people, they can comment on it. Right, rather than sending the document around, you just send a link. And then if someone wants to look at it, they can click and download the document. So very, very popular to run. You do this on iPad or phones and everything. Then this is another interesting one, email. So my, again, I can't click on this because if I click on this, it's going to go away. But this is the email client that I use, right? So I don't use a standard email. But you can see that my email clients, and this is free, right? All these, most, all these things I've shown you are free. You see, my, mine is very social. So I have things like, um, if you come down here, this is within my email, I have things like live events. So I can see, if someone goes and say they're married, I can see that, and it's up to me what I, you know. And then losing touch, it tells me people that I haven't been connecting with, or too many times. And social mentions, etc. okay? So very interesting, and then pocket. So as I find, this is also interesting, as I find useful things, I save it. So later on, you can, especially when you're doing research, you're doing research, you find, so I, when I find things, I don't always read it. I see something, I read the first two paragraphs or maybe two sentences. This is interesting. I might need it in, in future. I just save it. I just pocket it, right? And when I need to do research or write a paper, I go and search. That's where I start. And I then write my paper from it, right? Very, very useful tool, this pocket thing. Okay. And then this is where I become social with the world. So I have this website, and, and again, this is free. And most things that I do, I share, right? If I find something that's useful, I just share it here. So you can imagine if all of us were sharing information about our research on whatever it is, right? This is, and you can, like, if you look at this, you can see that I have a topic. And my, my purpose for, you know, working on this is because I want to simplify this technology called cloud, right? So that's it. So that's what I wanted to share with you, just show you some examples of how I'm using this outside of, you know, because I wanted to leave you, kind of, just get you to think a bit, and you might have picked one or two things that sound interesting. And so when you leave this room, you can go register on one of those sites. That was the idea, right? So there's, there's a, a call to action, so to speak, in terms of looking into some of these things. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shia. So for your very uh, interesting and useful presentation, uh, you have shown us how the social learning can make a difference in our research. Perhaps not only research, but more broadly in our life to connect people and to share the information and ideas. So we have 10 to 15 minutes to, for discussion. So if there is uh, one, two, three, two, okay, just one and two, please. Oh, maybe three, okay, please uh, go ahead. Oh, Hi, thank you. I'm kind of reluctant user.
So your question caused a tsunami. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm someone who's a bit reluctant social media user. Like, yes. I remember I joined Bebo and then Facebook came along and then Twitter and I was like, you know, forget it. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn as well, which is good. But th th there seems to be like an intimidating amount of these things. Yes. Yeah. What are there, you know, if you're going to be on, you know, three of them or whatever, especially the kind of academic, yes. what are the key ones that you really should be on? So, I, personally, I would, LinkedIn is one because that, that's much more professional, right? So that allows you to have a network. And I think the, um, the Africa Leadership Center should have a group on it as well. That, that's my view, um, absolutely. Twitter, because Twitter is about, it, it gives you a voice, right? It's what allows you to be a media company. And you guys talked about engaging, right, with, with, the, um, you know, with your stakeholders. And, and people find you, right? So you broadcast and people find you. And it's very focused. So I like Twitter a lot. Um, I don't use it maybe as much as most people do, right? But I would say Twitter would be the second one. Um, beyond those two, some people use Facebook. Um, I have an account on Facebook. I use it for family and, and um, personal relationships. And that's about it. Um, I also have, like I said, this thing, which I showed you called um, Scoop It or whatever. It's an aggregator, so I don't think of it as a platform itself. So what happens is that I post to it, and it then posts out to Twitter, to Facebook, and depending on what I select, right? So it doesn't, because some, again, the other point worth mentioning is that content isn't suitable for every platform, right? So you need to be very careful about what you post, depending on the relationships that you have on those platform. So for me, Facebook is very personal. Um, LinkedIn is um, business. So I can invite you to my LinkedIn profile without having met you. If I look at your profile and it looks good, I can connect with you. I normally wouldn't do that on Facebook, right? Because I don't necessarily share personal pictures on it, but I, you know, my wife does. Huh? So I'm, I'm connected to her, so you, of course you can see those pictures. Um, and Twitter, I think, is great. I, I think it's just simple, the way it works. And the other point worth mentioning is that the reason why a lot of people find social media um, intimidating is because they don't use um, a, a platform that simplifies the process. So there, is, there are platforms like Hootsuite, it's one of those, and what that does is that it allows you to just work on one, on one environment. And so you don't have to log on to Facebook, you don't have to log on to Twitter, you don't have to log on to LinkedIn or whatever, right? So you just work within that one space, and you can even schedule things, so it will actually take a lot of the work from you and you will post it at the right time when you're likely to get you know, the right re level of response. So the most effective people in the social media space don't go to all these different tools. It becomes, like you said, it's just too complicated. There are just too many. What they do is they select um, an aggregator. So they have a, a one tool that they use and they use that one tool to broadcast. And Hootsuite right, is one of the most popular. That's H-O-O-T and S-U-I-T-E. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for a very good um, information uh, with Mashai. We've spent a lot of time talking about the network <laughs> in APN uh, previously. Uh, I wanted to mention that there's one more that is really, really good for about as a community of 10 million researchers. Mm -hmm. It's called um, academia.edu, oh, yes. so yeah. and yeah. it will even yeah. select articles yeah. that has to do with you. If a new article yeah. comes out with somebody network, I link you with. Potential jobs in academics as yeah, well. That's right. That's it's a very really useful. Point. Very, yeah, I know. I know that. Yeah. Any other questions? Back at this one at the back. Thank you. Uh, thanks. My name is Amani. I'm a student. Um, it's it's a very fascinating um, thesis that you've brought up uh, today. Um, and so it's on. Um, okay, um, it's a very fascinating thesis you've um, come up with today. Um, you talk about things like disruption and new ways of thinking, and I think that the analog of disruption is inertia. I think that systems and people are generally resistant to change. Um, if you told um, a group that's based in Nairobi to relocate to Mumbai. You might have a lot of resignations. If you tell the same group to relocate to Nakuru, mm -hmm. you'll probably see a lot more people stay on. Yeah. 
And the reason I'm saying this is that a lot of what you've talked about today is the less disruptive form of innovation, I think. It's recombinant innovation, basically using what already exists um, to um, make systems better. And I think it is not just important, it's critical. Even in areas like leadership, for instance, you have a vice president or a president of a group uh, that manufactures products that are very technical and very um, uh, well suited for a technical minded audience, uh, but that don't sell well because the audience is the wrong audience. Right. If you take that position and you split it into two, two vice presidents, one a right um, brain thinker, one a left brain thinker, that can actually synergize the technicalities of the products into an audience that can actually use it, then you might actually get more sales. And so I think, I think the work you're doing here, it, it has almost infinite potential in situations where um, you don't necessarily want to go out there and buy new equipment and hire new people. Um, you basically want to look around you and leverage or use as a lever what you already have uh, to improve the situation. And it's even more so important in sub-Saharan Africa where people always say we need change, we need, we need, we need this to happen, we need better leadership, we need more, um, more, more money, more equipment. Um, but we don't really look around what we already have and ask ourselves those difficult questions about how we can recombine and recombinantly innovate. Yeah. It's, no, it's very agree. fascinating. That's Thank right. you. Uh, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. My name is Bode. Um I, I think I appreciate your lecture in terms of how it can help us um, share information, get to know a lot about um, networking, you know, and so on. However, you didn't speak on the challenges yeah. to some of these things, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the uh, information we get that. Uh, some of the information we have online yeah. are also being captured in some areas of the world. Yeah. So, so can you just share some of these challenges? You, you're right. I, you know, that's the thing about social media. People, I'm one of those who tends to think it's self-regulating in the sense that I, some, some countries try to regulate it, right? To say, okay, like you said, there are risks, right? So we're going to police it and we're going to make sure that, um, you know, things which you know, rightfully might not be accurate, right? Don't find them, their way into, into that medium. But I think that that fundamentally um, changes, right, the, the whole context around what social media is. It's about giving people a voice. Um, someone made reference to Ushaidi as an example. Ushaidi has this idea, so essentially crowdsourcing, right? And so you might look at it at, at face value and say, okay, but what if I go and I report incidents that are not real? Uh, you know, I have, a, I have an ulterior motive. The, the point there is that the, the platform itself, if you have a critical mass, it's self-regulating, you become a minority because the majority will actually report what is real, right? And there is a, in the case of Yushaidi, there, there was actually a process behind this, the scenes that validated some of that information. So in other, in other case, you had, in other words, you had um, you might have, there might have been something that says this has been verified, right? So there is information that is sourced, right, from the community that's not verified yet, but there, are, there is information that's actually been verified, right? So you have that way of categorizing the two types of information. But to answer your question, I, I think you're right. There are risks, right, with, with social media generally, and there are risks with me posting my information there. Someone might look at it and interpret it in a, in a different way. Um, on, but on the positive side, um, you're hoping that in terms of, you know, the, when, you, when you kind of do a risk assessment in terms of benefit, the potential is actually much greater. And, and where it's critical for you to actually, you know, where it's critical, you might have a, a verification or a validation process like the USHID guys had that says, okay, if you want information that's been verified, you're able to, you know, you're able to get to that, right? However, the other information is there, and you make a decision based on just how many times people reported it. So if you have you know, 100 people reporting an incident in a particular spot, right, then that's a lot more trustworthy than, in, you know, maybe, than maybe information reported somewhere where you have just two people. Right? So, so that, that's, you need to be careful as to how you use the information. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think there was one. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. And then, yeah. I, I, my name is Tari. I just had a quick question about, I guess, publicizing research because 
I think that uh, a lot of what you yes. showed was really, really useful for, I guess, building a personal brand or even yep. the brand of um, a group or a company yes. or a research group. Yeah. But in terms of actually taking what those groups mm -hmm. do and translating it into things that are easily digestible yeah. for a broader public, yeah. I just wanted to, I guess, get some of your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, you, actually, that's a very good point, right? So, so you're right. So there's an element of let's, let's make our research more visible, right? But you know what, when you work on research papers, you're creating that paper for peers, right? So you require a certain level of intellect to understand the, the context. In most cases, right, you, you need to understand the dynamics of a country or whatever. You make a good point in the sense that there might be informal platforms, like a blog, right, of the college, of the institution. And so some of that information gets simplified for, for a less sophisticated audience. So me, I'm not obviously an expert in, in peace, security, governance, right? But what you've talked about this week has been fascinating for me, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. So how do you make this information easily accessible and digestible for those of us who are not, you know, again, that, that's, that's one of the ways you could do it. Things like Twitter, all it does is that it gives you a way of having a code, a hashtag, you know, you index your research, and then you send it out. So if someone goes and searches for Rwanda, um, genocide, right? They might actually find your research paper, you know, and, and that's why I like it because it, it's, it's very much like that. Can we have one last one and then we. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Or oh, do we have more time? I think we're done. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Just very, um, I'm absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I just had two questions. Yeah. One, is there a place one can go or maybe you can talk to from your experience? Yeah. Within Africa, is there a place somebody can look at and to know which communities are looking at what? And I'm thinking both in terms of geographic, but also maybe social categories like youth or linguistic categories. Um, so that's one. Um, or political context. So if you're dealing with this, you're finding a lot of, this, these are the good things to use. And then um, just again from your experience, you talked about you're working with communities across um, can you say something about what kind of intellectual communities seem to be taking this up? Is it more universities, research, research networks, and so on? And then just very quickly, can you say anything about how to bring a cultural change in an institution? Oh, okay. So, so, so my view, so I'll, I'll start with the last one because I have a short memory. I've forgotten the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try. So I'll start with the last one. So how do you bring about cultural change, right? So my, my view, and again, I've seen this in very large organizations like IBM, and, you know, and it's like government, right? It's the same thing. I think it's a lot easier when it's from the top, when, when the guy at the top actually wants to, like Rwanda, right? I mean, th there's been a fundamental change, right, in, 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 in the country. And, and it's driven primarily by, by someone at the top who made a decision and said, you know, we, we need to see this through, right? And he's very committed to it. And, and that, that, that's what's driven, right, that, that culture. Now, that's top down. However, you know, the, you can also do some of this bottom up, right? So, so in the case of the environment I worked in, when we were trying to drive some of these ways of working within a business that was relatively formal, the way we did it was by identifying, you know, key people. You might call them, in our case, it was about sharing information. So we tried to identify in people whose personality lended itself. So they were already doing it, but not within the context of this new way, right? So we had to use them as ambassadors. We had to use them as essentially the foot soldiers. So they, within their network, they had a personal interest in doing that, and they became the channel through which we introduced some of these, these capabilities. But it had to be programmatic, right? Because otherwise, it just doesn't work. You need to find the right people, and you need to have a program that allows you to measure how effective right, it is. And by measuring it, then you can adapt. Because sometimes what you actually lead with might not actually be the right solution. Right? So that, that, that's what I observe. Right? Can be done bottom up. Um, it's a lot easier if it's done top down. So in the case of IBM, actually, there was a top down vision that said we want to be a social business. So that was there. But in terms of execution, it was very much done bottom up, you know, having got the mandate from. Then now, you, you asked the question about how do you find information, especially around Africa and, and Difficult one for me, right? Because um, what I noticed was that in, in the social media space generally, 
the, the presence of conversation on Africa is, is not as high as maybe in other parts of the world, but it does exist. So if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I've probably joined you know, the groups that I feel I can benefit from, that I could find. But they are not as much as you might have thought, right? And in many of the professional communities, there isn't a strong African presence or influence that's visible to me. Now, having said that, um, I guess in the youth, I, I don't know, I don't focus a lot on youth issue, is, issues, right? But I would have thought, if you look at the youth, there probably may be a lot more on places like Facebook. I don't know if there are a lot on things like Twitter, right? Or maybe LinkedIn, maybe not, because maybe they are not, don't consider themselves to be professionals yet. So it's a tough one for me. I don't have an, you know, an answer for you. But if I had to search, you know, if it was more professional, I'll start with things like LinkedIn, etc. And I'll use Twitter a lot because hoping that someone might have tweeted about something they found which they thought was helpful. And that's the beauty about Twitter, right? People just share things that they find. Okay. And the third thing you asked was, I think, about um, intellectual, something to do with intellectual groups that embrace this more. Um, again, what, what I find is that the um, people who are more, in terms of business or the corporate environment, people who are more technical, right, tend to embrace this because, again, this is what are you using to interact with these? You're using a laptop, you're using a computer, you're using maybe a mobile phone or whatever. If you're slightly more inquisitive technically, you most likely would have downloaded an app just to try it out, right? And then by virtue of trying it out, you then end up using it. So people who have that in inquisitive mind, you know, in terms of using technology, tend to use this a lot more. So that's one of the things that I found. And it also depends on the, the industry, right? So maybe people in marketing might use it more because that's a way of communicating with an external audience, right? So it's a useful source. Maybe in, you know, in research, like academia, the, web, the network that you talked about would be very popular for researchers, but maybe not so much generally because you know, maybe a lot of what they work on you know, isn't ready to be shared yet because you, know, you want to publish first, right? You want to publish first before anyone else you know, steals your idea and publishes it before you. So I think different types of communities, the rate of adoption varies, and also the, the way in which the capabilities they adopt also vary as well, right? But I, I would say um, the technical, maybe I see it more because I'm technical, right? So I, I, I always feel these days, if you are very smart and you want to set up a business, like the guy who set up Facebook, right, and he's a billionaire, whatever he is, you can do it. And, and that's why it always frustrates me when we talk about private equity and the level of investment going into Africa, that the information society isn't talked about a lot because you can create significant amounts of wealth and opportunity just from a laptop and a good mind, right? And I, don't, and I know we're doing it in IHOB and we're trying to do all of that, but I, I see tremendous potential because that's the only infrastructure that you need for business. You need a good mind and you need access to something you can use to create software and, and a bit of help, right, to get it to market. As, you know. Okay, so thank you very much for your um, very active yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, I I was waiting to hear the kind of comments yeah. that would come from our colleagues. Yeah. Because I think what I suspect is that many of our colleagues are not mm -hmm. you know, necessarily IT savvy, yeah. savvy or mm -hmm. interested yeah. uh, in IT in general. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very clear that being able to manage information yeah. and you know, push the boundaries yeah. is the only way we can do what you just suggested. Mm -hmm. And I find it interesting that you went to uh, check ALC out in particular places yeah. that were not there, you know, yeah. <laughs> as such. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that, that that is, you know, that confirms, yeah. you know, why some, you know, engagement with someone like yourself will be yeah. beneficial to this entire, mm -hmm. not just the organization, but the network. Yeah. Because what you said at the start uh, about people within hierarchies yeah. being able to connect to mm -hmm. such, you know, yeah. an expansive network is what this is about. Yeah. And if you've been here the past couple of days, after the, actually the whole week, yeah. you've had both uh, sets of people yeah. who work within the ALC hierarchy as hierarchical as yeah. you know, it gets, yeah. you know, um, and our broader network. Yeah. And how to make this uh, sort of connection a natural one is what we're working towards. I have two questions, uh, yeah. uh, sorry. One has to do with where is, if there was a consolidated place, for example, I, I'm not necessarily, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm communication shy. Yeah. So deliberately, I'm not on Facebook, mm -hmm. Twitter, on, yeah. or any of those things. Yeah. And I also don't have the time to spend on those things. Yeah. But I know that my organization, whether it's Kings mm -hmm. or ALC, whatever I'm affiliated to, I depend on their presence That's on those places. Yeah. What is the console? You know, is there a consolidated place mm -hmm. where we can do all of those things that you're talking about without yeah. having to go looking for That's them? Right, a yeah. user yeah. like me, I need everything mm -hmm. in one place. Yeah. Is the website the place? Yeah. For example, yeah. where I can go to and I know that I can make a choice to use this or not use that yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, and you know, related to that, mm -hmm. related to the first one is, mm -hmm. for example, we're also an educational mm -hmm. establishment yeah. where we run mm -hmm. short courses and so on. I would like a consolidated place, for mm -hmm. example, where all our network can access mm -hmm. almost everything that we have. But the second and related to that is the fear I have uh, of cloud-based systems. Mm -hmm. I use them. But uh, there's only one country in the Baltics mm -hmm. that I think the entire, was it Estonia? Mm -hmm. Estonia was attacked in 24 hours, the yeah. entire system collapsed, you know, cyber attack. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. as a security person, I know that that is the next yeah. domain mm -hmm. of yeah. that sort of crisis. Mm -hmm. How yeah. safe exactly. are cloud-based systems if yeah. we put all our e energy in, yeah. you know, securing something like that? Sorry. Okay, so, okay, no, that, that's great. So the first thing I'd say in terms of the first question, I, I think you probably need a digital strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So you need a communications department that focuses on how you're going to build your brand in the digital space because it's something you can't ignore, right? Um, a lot of people rely on it, and that's where they get their information from. I, I think if you had, you know, a group, and that might just be the you know, the, the marketing team that you have, right? Taking a more proactive, um, um, what do you call it? Taking a more proactive view on, on how they market using digital, di um, the digital media. So that, that's what I would say. Everybody doesn't have to do it. And um, the point is, if, if people do it, if, if the alumni and, and most of us in the room get involved in doing that, it amplifies that message, right? So that's the benefit of that approach. But in terms of an institution, you can rely on, on the media. You know, I, I join Richard Branson's whatever, right? And every, every single minute, <laughs> there's, something, there's something on LinkedIn from Richard Branson. So someone posted, come on, I don't see Richard sitting on his laptop every day. Where the hell is this coming from? <laughs> and clearly it wasn't, you know, but that's the point, right? He, I mean, those guys do it a lot, but it's clearly a, a marketing team, right? Sending all those, those things. But I think, yeah, you, you can do it that way, and that's what I, I would recommend. Now, the other issue about security, right? I, I think it's, um, it's an interesting one because it comes up a lot. But you know, a lot of it is just based on fear, right? It's not based on, I mean, like you said, think about how big cloud is. And then it's like flying. You know, I'm gonna get on a plane and I'm flying to London and I'm thinking, goodness, this stuff is so risky. But when you look at the, the number of incidents, right, in the big scheme of things, getting into a taxi and driving to town might actually be more risky in terms of potential harm, right, accidents. And I think cloud is kind of like that. When incidents occur, they are very visible, so we know about it, right? But, but the number of times, given how much is used and how much people try to hack it, right? So every single minute, someone is trying to hack a, a cloud system. Um, the level of safety is actually quite high. And, and the thing is, because clouds, because the consequences are so high, a lot of these service providers go through very stringent um, regulation around auditing. So they have a process where they audit. And you don't have that with a lot of in-house systems. Because in-house systems, you control it. The level of due diligence is not as, so you have this false sense of security because you think it's in-house. But you need to select the provider very well, right? But once you've done that, you're right. I mean, you're, you're still vulnerable, but they, they do have safeguards. And the safeguards would be things like you've got backups, and we don't want to go into that, right? But they do have safeguards because the consequence, even in the case of Estonia, I can assure you that they probably lost minimal data, right? It was restored, and maybe it was down for 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever it was, but it was restored, right? And, and you got, maybe you lose, lost a little bit, but, but not as, you see what I mean? Not as much as if you actually did it yourself, and, and the building, and there was a fire. So I went to Ghana once, and there was an internet service provider, not internet service provider, the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs, one of those ministries. I don't know if there's anyone from Ghana. Yeah, but there was a ministry that burned down. Yeah, and, and they had a lot of things that were just lost, right? Just lost. I mean, even though government and cloud and security is always a big deal, but that would have probably been better in that instance, right? Yeah. Yeah.